Hi. How are you doing? I'm Mohammad Sadri, postdoctoral researcher at Microelectronics System Design Research Group of TU Kaiserslautern. This is section four of lesson nine, and lesson nine is about, in fact, creating a software which will be running on the ARM host and the software is responsible for briefly it is responsible for transferring data from the PL to the PS so what we have done uh, I will show you briefly again so these are the videos that I am creating um, for myself as a kind of hobby uh, in my free time and they are not official and the contents I don't guarantee the correctness of whatever I say here so use these videos at your own risk and I suggest you to always have a look at Xilinx documentation when you are working on your project but I think through these videos you can really accelerate learning um, the Zinc device and learning how you should program in fact for different parts of the Zinc device so what we had previously is this system this basic system which contains a set of Axi stream components and then it contains one Axi DMA unit and the Axi DMA unit is responsible for receiving the Axi stream and then copying the Axi stream to the DRAM memory. So we are with this component, we are transferring the data from our Axi stream board, which is in the PL of the Zing device, to the PS of the Zing device. In fact, this guy is copying the data to the DRAM memory, and the DRAM memory is also accessible by the ARM host. So practically what you are doing here, you are transferring the data from the PL to the PS. And so what, what we did in previous videos in section one and section two, we designed this hardware. And in section three, we went through the software development kit. And I showed you the first step that you always need to do in order to in fact run an application a bare metal application on your arm host so we talked about uh, in section 3 we talked about the FSBL which was the first stage bootloader and we tested the first, first stage bootloader practically on the Zinc device and I showed you the operation and I showed you it is working and we talked briefly about the XMD environment and how you can use the XMD environment of Xilinx to test your applications on the Zinc device and to see if they are working properly or not. So I developed the, the in fact, the FSBL it is working. And then at the end of the section three, I created this simple hello world application that you see here and I'm going to convert this code to the code that is responsible for programming the Axi DMA, accepting interrupts from the Axi DMA, handling interrupts, and then practically doing the data transfer from the PL to the PS. So in order to begin, I want to mention one very important point, the first step and in, indeed the first change that I need to do in this code is that if I come back to my, in fact, Vivado design here, I have the Zinc PS here, yes? And then I have this Axi interconnect, which is implemented on the PL and I have this link and this link is in fact the link which is transferring the data from the PL world to the PS world. And I am using the SXI HP0 port for this purpose. The point is when you turn on, in fact, your Zinc device, by default, you cannot transfer any data, any signal between the PS and the PL. 
Indeed, there are a set of level shifters on the boundary of the PS and the PO, which transfer the signals between these two. And by default, these level shifters, they are disabled. They are not active and they are not doing anything. So there is no signal passing between these two boundaries. So inside my program, the first thing that I need to do is to enable these level shifters. Otherwise, the rest of the code that I will, I will write is, is useless, will not do anything. And then I come back here again to my Vivado design and I look here, I have the clock and I have the reset signal. And these guys, they are, they are being produced by the PS. And the point is, by default, when you turn on your Zinc device, when you program your PL, and in fact, when you run the FSPL, when you reach this stage, the reset signal is active. So even if you enable the level shifters, the hardware that you have here will not do anything because it is in a reset mode. So one other thing that you need to do in the code that you write here is you should disable the reset signal in fact the reset signal is by default zero and i need to pull it up to one so i need a code which should be executed on the arm host and this code is responsible for disabling the reset okay and honestly speaking, uh, I don't remember if the code was also needed to uh, enable clock. I don't remember if the clock was by default enabled or not. We will see. We will see very soon. So in this video, uh, different than my previous videos, I will not uh, write the code again by hand. Okay, so I have the code written in a file and I have tested, in fact, the code. And I will paste the code part by part into the screen and I will describe the code because if I want to write it from scratch uh, here maybe it takes a lot of time so I come back to the uh, software development kit environment and uh, so the primary task is to enable level shifters and to release the reset right and indeed if I look at the initial hardware platform zero folder that when I in fact exported my design from Vivado to the SDK environment this, these files are created automatically for me if I look at these uh, let me open this one for example if I look at ps7 underline init.c I see a set of important functions inside this guy and the first one is ps7 underline init I talked about it almost extensively this function is responsible in fact for initializing all of the registers of the PS okay so this function is practically calling these codes that you have here these strange codes that you have here and each of these guys is responsible for initializing one of those registers and now there is another important function here and that is called let me find it it is called so this one is ps7 init and there is another function here which is called ps7 post config and what does this ps7 post config do it does exactly what we want to happen we want uh, the level shifters to become enabled to reset signal to get released yes and this function performs these operations for us so what i need to do in my code is just to add a call to this function the point is maybe you say with yourself the fsbl should have done this for me it is true the code inside fsbl for some boot modes it calls in fact this function or better to say performs these operations but when you are in fact booting your system using the jtag mode as i did and as i showed you in the previous section then the fsbl will not 
enable the level shifters will not release the reset signals and you should do it yourself but I think when you in fact boot your zinc device over the SD card then the FSBL performs this operation for you automatically and I don't think in that case you really need to call this function again inside your main routine but right now, since we are debugging our application and we are in the debugging phase, and we are not releasing something final and we want to load the application continuously over JTAG and run it and see how it is behaving. And I don't want right now to use the SD card. I want to load my application over the JTAG to the board to run it to see if it is correct, is not correct. If it is not correct, I can reboot the system very fast. Uh, reset the system very fast and load the new application and this is much easier than um, in fact using the SD card because then with the SD card whenever you change something you should bring out the SD card from the Z board you should put it inside your laptop you should copy all of the files to the, to the SD card and you should put it back a lot of uh, physical activities that I don't think are necessary so here I have this guy and I have in fact these two files and the simplest thing that I can do I can add these two files also to my hello world project okay so the first step I copy these two guys into this folder and I don't know if I can do it here so let's ps7 init underlines ps7 underline init that's see I copy and then here let's uh, inside the source folder I paste this guy because I I feel I need it here and then also for the header file I do the same so inside the source I paste it and now these two guys are in fact in your project they are added to your project so what you do inside your main you inside your main main is here sorry you I think first you include ps7 underline in it dot h in, in inside your code so let's do this let's add this include line to the to the code yeah okay this is the first include that I need to have and then inside my main routine I think I what I do after any platform I call the function that I talked about for you so after any platform I have this ps7 post config now let's save the file and let the SDK environment to compile the application and see if it gets compiled correctly okay so so far I think it's so good so uh, right now after this function we have our PL enabled okay now I continue uh, with the code maybe we um, we can first uh, talk about a little bit about the print function i usually like to uh, use the, the instead of a normal print or printf i usually like to use the xilinx printf the xilinx version of the printf so uh, I, I want to add here another header file and the header file will contain the call to these Xilinx functions um, both the Xilinx printf and also the Xilinx functions that soon I will use for transferring data to specific address locations in the memory for writing data to specific address locations and for reading data from a specific address locations so there is another header file I want to add to the system so is called I had it here okay it's called zeal underline io dot h 
and then uh, this guy I don't like it I I change it to zeal printf and this I don't need anymore okay then uh, maybe if we want to complete the list of the header files that we need um, I I would like to tell you that here if I look at my hardware I can see that there is an interrupt line which is coming from the XI DMA this interrupt line is entering in fact the zinc PS and is going to the arm house and inside my code I want to handle the interrupts that are being generated by this XI DMA unit indeed whenever the XI DMA unit finishes one of the tasks one of the transfer tasks that we have assigned to it it will generate an interrupt to show that the task is finished and so to, to handle interrupts we need a special header file and also I add that special header file here uh, it's called xscugic I think it is x scoop I scoop control unit probably global intro controller I think I don't know I'm not sure and then uh, the final header file which is actually the most important one I want to add right now and this guy is very important because it actually contains all of the information of the hardware that you have on the PL so let me add it and then I describe what it is so is maybe you have heard its name before or maybe you have seen it before you have used it before if you have worked with any kind of xilinx based embedded system probably you have here the name of the xparameters.h file because it is being used from the old versions of the embedded development kit up to now so here we have the in fact list of um, the header files that we need and I think our list is kind of complete so I want to show you the contents of this guy because um, this is this is an important guy and in order to do that I need to find this file I don't know where can I find it probably in the if I have hello world and then I have hello world board support package and maybe I can find it here I'm not sure let's see if x parameters dot h is okay here is the x parameters dot h and what we have here in fact this header file contains the parameters uh, related to the units that you have on the PL and from these parameters which ones are the most important based obviously the addresses so I, I come back to the Vivado environment again if we look at the components that we have here if we look at the XI DMA we can see as I have described to you the XI DMA contains one XI stream slave port it is an XI stream port it doesn't have addresses but in order for the Zinc PS for the ARM host to, to be able to access the registers inside this guy and to control this guy and to configure this guy the XI DMA has also one memory mapped slave interface and this memory mapped slave interface if I follow up it, con it comes to this um, in fact interconnect XI interconnect and the XI interconnect is connected to the GP0 port of the Zinc device okay and practically the arm host that we have here 
through the GP0 port, it can write to the registers of XIDMA and it can read from the, the registers. So this master XIDMA can be seen by the ARM host that we have here through an address. So it has an address. And what is the address? Actually, the address is indicated in address editor. If I look at processing system 7 section, then it has three slaves. And one of the slaves is the XIDMA. And there's an address for the XIDMA. There's an, in fact, base address and a range for the XIDMA. For the rest of, in fact, XI memory mapped slaves that you have on the PL, the same rule holds true. So for two GPIO, XI GPIO blocks that we have here, for XI GPIO 0, XI GPIO 1, they are both of these guys, again, they are XI memory mapped slave units, and they have an address. They are connected to this XI interconnect. And the XI interconnect, as I told you, it is connected to the Zinc PS. And on the Zinc PS, we have the MXI GP0 port. And through this port, the ARM host is able to write to these guys, to control these guys, to write data to them, to read data from them. And these guys have an address. They have an address. And what is X parameters? Uh, dot h in fact this file is indicating these addresses it is transferring these addresses to the software environment so whenever you export your hardware from here from the vivado environment to the software development kit of xilinx one of the most important files which is being created is this x parameters dot h file and it contains the addresses it contains the important configuration parameters of each of your blocks and here in my in fact hello world.c application the application that i'm working on it i include this file and in order to access those components what i do i use the contents of the definitions provided by x parameters at edge and so let me uh, double check if the numbers here are correct. For example, xpar underline xi underline dma0 base address 404040. Okay, let's see if this is correct or not. 404040. Okay, and then the rest of them. So there are very maybe interesting and important information in, inside this file. And it has a very high level of redundancy. Actually, you can you can find uh, different names, different constants pointing to the same value. Okay. For example, for the base address of XIDMA, practically I see two constants. And I think it is because uh, it it has mainly historic reasons because. For example, I remember at one time in, in the past, the Linux kernel was also using this file in order to recognize where is each piece of hardware. And then other guys, they were all using this file and each of these guys was searching for its required parameters and they, they had used their own names. And I think this is why you have several names for one constant because each of those important systems they were seeking for their own specific desired name anyway we have the file here and this parameter will be very important for us because then we use this one to access the xi dma and to assign a transfer task to it and then uh, let me go through the file and see what other parameter is really important for me well, here I have the clock frequency of the CPU, 666 MHz, and actually my device is, I think, it's a, it's a minus one device. The speed grade is minus one. I have described this in the Kaiser's Law Turn video, um, the speed grade and the speed of the ARM host, its relationship. 
and so please refer to lesson eight for that and then um, what else is interesting for me here ethernet some definitions related to the ps and here we go we have also the base address for gpio zero and we have also the base address for gpio one okay and what else is important for us what else i am seeking for is a very important parameter that i want to find it here and to show you actually yeah here we go so we have the introp number the introp number and do you remember in section two we talked about this one i was not sure uh, in fact to which interline to which internal interrupt line of the ps the interrupt that i am connecting to the ps is is getting connected so if i come back here in vivado environment and if i come back to the zinc um to the zinc uh, ps and double click on this just i need to i will come back soon sorry now if i go to the interrupts part i have fabric interrupts and then i have ps to pl interrupt port and then here is in indeed the port to which i have connected our interrupt line from the axi dma and if you remember i was in doubt at the time of uh, creating the hardware whether the intro will be connected to line 91 or 61 and what i see here in fact from this um, xparameters.h is that the intro is connected to line 61 okay i think for now this information from xparameters.h file are enough there are lots of other important parameters here that you may want to use during your software development but i think for our simple hello world application which is responsible for configuring the axi dma module i think so this description for x parameters that is enough so i i come back to the developing the main and here what I need to do is a set of uh, simple steps in, inside my main. Obviously, um, the next step will be to initialize uh, the Axel DMA unit. And for that, I have created a function. So what I want to do is the following. I want to initialize the axi dma and here i have a function i have called initialize axi dma and i call it so let me paste for you the initialize axi dma and this one is an important function actually and i think it not it needs quite some descriptions how is it is written and how i have understood in fact how i have found out how to write this function so we have initialized xr dma it is responsible for initial um doing initial settings of the xr dma unit and um actually if you look at the code that i have written it is nothing more than a set of simple memory reads and memory writes so what i have done is i have performed first a memory read from a specific location in the axi dma memory okay so I have read 
I have performed a read from a specific location inside the XI DMA and then I have made a modification on the read value and then I have written back the results to exactly the same position in the XI DMA and the question is how do I understand uh, from where from which location in the XI DMA I should read what change should I make and in fact what is the operation that this guy is doing obviously these are all coming from the Xilinx documentation and the documentation of the core so let me open for you the documentation of the core if I can find it here down uh, and I have um, here DMA DMA and this this document that I'm going to show you is accessible through the in fact the Vivado environment itself you can also use Vivado environment itself so here inside Vivado environment if you double click on XI DMA uh, here you have the documentation which opens for you the documentation navigator and from there you can have the latest version of XI DMA actually conditioned to the fact that to the um, fact that the documentation nav navigator work because I have seen a lot of times it doesn't work so if it is working you can through this link obtain the documentation if it is not working then you need to do a simple search inside Xilinx website and you'll definitely find this document since it is very important so how do I understand what changes I should do how do I should I behave with XI DMA it is simple it is in chapter 3 designing with the core and actually if you open um, every document of the cores that you have here the IPs that you have here inside Vivado usually they have a chapter is called designing with the core the chapter and there it is described how you can really program the core and how you can use it so here what I have is programming sequence so I have a section is called programming sequence and if I look at programming sequence this programming sequence is described for simple DMA mode and then it is described for a scatter gather mode so for each of these modes is completely described how you should program the XI DMA so the programming sequence is described here okay and right now we are using the simple DMA mode we disable the scatter gather mode as um, I described to you in section 2 and so what I should uh, do is I should follow the instructions that we have here and another point is that right now we have only the write channel active we don't have the read channel active so we don't have indeed if I make this guy a little bit uh, larger programming sequence direct register mode and the, the sequence that you see here is in fact to begin uh, the mm to s channel operation okay while right now the channel that i have in my xi dma is s2 mm channel yes i have here xi dma s2 mm yes a stream to memory map and right now i don't have m to s mm to s which is memory map to stream that is when you want to read back data from the DRAM memory okay and right now I don't have it I want just to transfer data from the PL to the PS and here is the sequence that I should follow uh, to initialize and to program the XR DMA and to make it operational okay and so let me uh, write for let me read the first line for example I start the S2 mm channel running by setting the run stop B to 1 so I should set the S2 
mm-dmacr.rs register to this specific bit of this register to one okay but how do i understand where is this register located definitely this register is located somewhere inside the axle dma but the address is again inside the documentation so if i uh, yeah if i go i think up here product specification let me see latency and throughput resource utilization port descriptions i don't want it is the register space in fact section and in the register space you usually find the list of all of the registers that you have inside the unit inside the ip and the operation of each of these registers and its address okay so it is offset address Okay, so right now I am seeking for DMACR register, right? So and I'm not looking at a scatter gather. I'm looking I'm looking at direct register mode, and uh, for the direct register mode, I am looking for DMACR register for S two MM channel. Okay, so this is the register that we are looking for. This is the register that we are looking for. S2MM underline DMACR. And where it is located is located at base address plus 30. 30 is the offset. 30 hex is the offset. So what I should do as the document described, I should go and set one of the specific bits inside this register to one. The bit was called RS right so I, I scroll down until i find in fact the description of this register okay let's see where i can find dmacr yeah this is one dmacr here but it is for mm2s uh, i think if i scroll down i probably find s2mm dmacr so let's be patient and scroll down but this they are the same practically so the bit sequence inside the registers they are the same so okay here what do i have is s2mm underline dmacr the, the description of the bits and the documentation was telling me to set this guy to one right and it was not telling me to change the these guys it was telling me to set this one to one okay and now i come back to the code what I do in the code, I read this register and practically I set that special bit to one and I write it back. Okay, then now if you look, I am also enabling another bit inside this register and I think that is the bit which enables the Axi DMA to produce interrupts. So here we have the, um, I think, IOC, IO completion interrupt request this specific bit here bit number 12 the bit numbers are beginning from zero bit number 12 i should also set this one as this register as one this specific flip-flop as one because i want the axi dma to produce interrupts for me when it finishes each of the transfer tasks so if you look at my code you see i have set the first bit to one and that specific bit to one so I have read the current value of that register. I have made my modification and I have written back the register in its own place. And then what I have done here in the rest of the code is a very simple. I just read back the register and print it to make sure that the change that I have made is applied and this is usually a good idea to do it uh, because sometimes something else is wrong you think you have written to the register but you have not your hardware doesn't work and you don't understand where is the problem so this kind of checking is usually good especially for initial phases of application development okay So I think we have initialized XI DMA complete and we can proceed to the next step 
okay so I come back to the main and the next step I want to enable this unit enable sample generator okay as you remember from lesson 7 this uh, sample generator has one enable port and has one axi enable port and actually the axi enable port I have tied to zero because I don't want I want the sample generator to generate samples from itself and the enable I want to set it to one because I want the sample generator to begin generating samples for me and then I want to set also a value for the frame size as you remember on the axia stream interfaces we had the TLAS signal and the TLAS was kind of indicating the end of each packet and as you remember from lesson 7 our sample generator is designed so that you can in fact define the size of the packet and so in our hardware I have connected both of these guys to two uh, in fact GPIOs and here inside my code what, inside my software what I want to do is to indicate to specify these two values okay so um, obviously inside my software I need to write to these two GPIO units in order to uh, do the changes which are required so in here I come inside the um, in fact my program and I have another portion of code that I paste here for you it's called enable sample generator and it accepts a value uh, which is actually the size of your packet so this is the value which will be written to if I look here which one of the GPIOs is the one yeah this one this is the value which will be written to XI GPIO 0 okay so I come back here and I show you the definition for enabled sample generator so enable sample generator okay this is the guy actually it is very simple it is to write operations to these two GPIO interfaces and actually when you want to write to GPIO interface is just enough to write to the base address actually at offset 0 resize the register to which if you write you can in fact indicate the output value for this GPIO output okay and by default your GPIO unit is in output mode it's not reading from outside but it is sending data to outside but what if you wanted to for example use the GPIO for reading something from outside then there's again the documentation of Xilinx and maybe I can cover this in another example but there's the documentation for GPIO and the same as in fact actually DMA you can look at the documentation and see how you should configure the GPIO so that you can read the data from outside so here is the documentation for GPIO if it get loaded yeah it's the GPIO and I have again designing with the core uh, chapter and product specification chapter and inside product specification chapter I expect to see port descriptions so if I look at port descriptions it has a set of um, output ports input ports and then a kind of tri-state port and okay and here if I look at after at after zero GPIO data um, is, is the data that you put outside 
for channel 0 each GPIO contains two channels and yeah then using this register that you have here you can control the direction of the data whether the GPIO should drive the data to the output or it should receive the data from outside and by default it is in output mode but you can change it to input mode and GPIO data let me yeah GPIO data register and I think the GPIO data register is a kind of read write register so when you configure the GPIO unit as input in input mode then if you read this register I think you will read the value which is uh, available on the port of the GPIO okay maybe we talk about this one in detail later for now come back to the SDK we have these two line of code and they are actually driving the signals as we wish and for now I think it is completely enough so I continue now the sample generator is enabled uh, one final step before actually beginning the DMA operation is remaining and that is to initialize the interrupt system okay so that in fact we can accept interrupts so I have another function here for this part uh, I copy paste sample generator is enabled I have not yet begun uh, DMA transactions what I do first I initialize the interrupt system and this initialize interrupt system to to this uh, function in fact I am passing the device ID of the interrupt controller which is practically zero okay and so what is the implementation of initialize interrupt system I I come and paste for you this function and one related function yeah let's put it here okay so I have initialize interrupt system um, it has a set of functions and you usually can use them as they are right now the only thing uh, you need to change is in fact this one the interrupt ID and if you are using different names for the function for the interrupt handler then the name of the interrupt handler otherwise the rest of the code is usually unchanged you can use it as it is so um, basically what is uh, happening here is it's looking up the configuration of the interrupt controller and then it performs an initialization on the interrupt controller and then it sets up the interrupt system and this is the setup interrupt system function which uh, which enables uh, the exception handler of the arm core and then after that it connects your interrupt handler the function that you write to handle the interrupt to in fact this specific interrupt line okay and then it enables the interrupt now the point uh, is this interrupt handler I should write the interrupt handler so whenever the interrupt comes what should my system do here is my final piece of code that I want to show you and that is the interrupt handler so I paste it here obviously when the interrupt comes what I need to do is to begin another transfer yes so when I assign a task to the XI DMA 
The Axe IDMA performs the transfer and generates an interrupt. When the interrupt is received by the ARM host, as of the code that we have written, this function will be executed. So this is the function in which you should go with your ARM host and read the data which is being copied to the DRAM memory and process that data. If you want to process it, this is the location that you should process that data. And if you want to initiate another transfer task to the XR DMA, again, this is the point, this is the location in which you can really initiate another transfer task to the XR DMA unit. So right now, what I am doing here is um, practically I'm not uh, really processing the data, which is copied to the DRAM memory. What I am doing in this current interrupt handler is I'm just initiating in the next transfer task. Okay, and uh, I have a kind of counter. And each time an interrupt comes, I increase this counter by one. So I have a set of definitions that I should add as global definitions to my code. And these global definitions, one of them is this global frame counter that I have inside my interrupt handler. And the rest are related to the interrupt handling, handling system. I also paste those definitions to the code here yeah I will I will fix this one later so I added these uh, definitions global definitions here this is a global frame counter this is just a simple unsigned integer and the role of this variable is is just a counter in my code is counting the number of times that the interrupt is happening and the two other guys that you see here one is the interrupt controller in fact is the structure related to interrupt controller and its parameters that we used inside the initialize interrupt system function and then the rest the other one is again GIC config that as you saw again we have used inside the initialized interrupt system and for the initialized interrupt system I tell you it's kind of a little bit complicated maybe not easy to understand but um, don't worry because it's not actually changing what you need to change what you need to add is for each of your interrupts in fact you have the same uh, set of code what you need to do is for each of your interrupt you connect the interrupt line to that specific interrupt handler that you have written okay and then you enable uh, in fact the interrupt and inside uh, your exception handler you have always the same code so it, it's not practically complicated it's simple because you don't really deal with writing this thing from scratch yourself you just can copy paste it every time you need it and honestly speaking I'm not uh, really a fan of this type of complicated coding obviously for interrupt controller there is no way but for DMA for example uh, there's another way of programming the DMA and that is uh, through using the structs and the, the library routines that the Xilinx are already provides to you for the DMA I think maybe I have maybe i have these files yes i have here xxi dma xxi dma hardware and whatever i do here i initialize the dma and then i i begin a transfer task using dma xilinx has 
abstracted all of this functionality through a set of functions and you can use those functions and then if you use those functions you will not see these xilinx in xilinx out uh, calls but uh, you will see an almost similar approach that what you see here and sometimes i think with myself it is unnecessarily complicated so i usually prefer to write it simple and easy to understand and uh, easy to debug in fact because then here using this me simple method if if anything went wrong you can really debug what is happening but uh, that is another way that you can go you can include this uh, probably this x xidma.h and then use directly the functions which is inside this guy okay so here i have uh, my intro handler and inside the intro handler i am doing some set of very simple tasks when the intro occurs obviously i clear the intro the first step that you do is to clear the intro um, and for clearing the intro there is again in the axo dma documentation there is a specific bit to which you should write and then i increase the global frame counter meaning that i have received another intro and i have just um, a printf a simple printf here if the total number of interrupts that i am receiving is bigger than 10 million i print something and then practically what is happening at the end of this function i start another dma transfer okay so the, the final part is a start dma transfer and this function if i add to my code my code is almost finished so start dma transfer i paste for you start dma transfer I put it here start dma transfer it it receives two parameters destination address and lengths the destination address is the address inside the dram memory to which the dma the axial dma should transfer data so this destination address is indicating to which location in the DRAM memory, to which physical address in the DRAM memory, the XR DMA should write the data that it receives through the XR stream interface. Okay, extremely important parameter. And then the final parameter is the amount of data in bytes that the XR DMA should transfer. How much data the XR DMA should transfer in each transfer task. Okay. So in the transfer task that you define, for example, you may want to tell it to transfer 32 bits, 256 bits, 264 bytes, and whatever. So this, this length of transfer is defined here. And actually what the function does is again very simple and straightforward. It writes the destination address to that specific register inside the XIDMA and also the length to its specific register inside the axi dma and as you write the links to the axi dma the transfer will begin okay so there is no specific start bit to trigger the transfer the trigger is when you write the links to the axi dma and when you do this the transfer begins and as the transfer finishes what happens is uh, the intro will happen and this guy will be called okay let's save the code and i want to add the final final line of the code i have initialized the intro system and i am at the end of the main and i should begin one transfer here right to to begin in fact the chain of transfers i should do the first dma transfer here otherwise nothing will happen otherwise the intro system will be initialized but practically you have not begun any transfer and the code finishes we've reached the end so as the final part as the final uh, section of my main i do one transfer one transfer i paste it here yeah so first dma transfer i have i have put a get char here so you should press 
um, a bottom on your keyboard to begin the first transfer okay that is it our code is complete and we can test it on the Z board before I continue I want to mention a very important point about the addresses to which you 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 transfer data in the DRAM memory if you're running Linux then the MMU of the ARM subsystem is active and if the MMU the memory management unit is active then the addresses that your ARM host sees they are virtual they are not physical and when you want to transfer in fact you want to pass a transfer task to the Axel DMA you should first translate that virtual address to physical address but right now that I am running a bare metal application this is not true all of the addresses are physical and the MMU is not active okay so when I am uh, saying start DMA transfer and I'm specifying this address this address is actually a physical address and it should point to a physical location in the DRAM memory so it is important that you specify a correct value here if you for example specify a, an address which is not residing on the DRAM memory nothing will happen or strange things will happen okay usually one good idea is to use the malloc function okay so here again you can use the malloc function and you can call malloc and it will allocate for you an ad uh, region on the DRAM memory and it will pass you the address of that region and you can practically use that address inside uh, your transfer task but right now for this code uh, I have not used malloc I have just indicated an address on the DRAM memory okay and if I was running Linux it was totally wrong this what I have done you can never use an address in the DRAM memory without first allocating it and this is something I will talk about hopefully extensively when I talk about developing kernel level drive device drivers for the Zinc uh, device under the Linux uh, so this is this is a topic we will hopefully talk about soon and there I will mention all of these points but right now I am running a bare metal application and this address is a physical address and you may ask me from where I have obtained this address well if I if I look at the Zinc TL, TRM do I have the Zinc TRM here yeah this is the Zinc TRM and if, if you look at chapter 4 of the Zinc TRM chapter 4 Zinc TRM and this is the address map of the Zinc system I, I, I'm not sure I think I have shown this table to you before and actually here in this address map this 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 region is the region in which you can uh, write and this is the region of oh, sorry and this is the region this bigger region is the region of the DRAM memory so uh, when you want to transfer data transfer the data to a range here so that you can be sure that the destination of data is in a correct location and maybe the simplest is to transfer data here because you are sure that in whatever mode the system is operating you are writing to the data not to the on-chip memory and not uh, not to any other region than the DRAM. Okay. Yeah, I come back. Here we have the code, and we have the ELF it is called uh, hello world ELF and I can execute this guy and I can see the results uh, so let's do it and let's have a first test 
of our new software and see if it is working or not working or what okay I come back I come here to the environment in which I can run in fact the XMD and I can have the terminal and let me turn on my zinc board so for the zinc board I need to make sure that I have all of the USB connections available first thing and then I should make sure that I have the power available and now here let me run the terminal okay let me turn on the board run the terminal yeah the terminal is not seen by the board I don't know why okay the terminal is ready I just repowered the board and here uh, I run the XMD and yeah maybe I run the XMD with the history option that is more useful XMD minus history and let's the first thing that we do we program the FPGA okay and the next thing that we do we connect to the arm uh, subsystem connect arm hardware okay and the next thing that I should do I should run first the first stage bootloader so I find it I don't know where it is is it fine hopefully it is somewhere yeah though the first stage bootloader yeah this guy it's messed there okay so what I do I say run and as I say run I expect to see something here on my terminal okay which shows me FSBL is running and now that FSBL is run, has in fact executed I stop the processor and I go toward my main executable which is the hello world.elf and this is the guy which is responsible for in fact handling the DMA so I load this application though hello world.elf and I run this application okay so run and as I run this application I come here and I, I, I look at the in fact console performing the first DMA transfer press a key to begin okay so I, I just press the key and this should make the transfer begin and now you will ask how do I understand if in fact a transfer has begun or not or what is going on inside the system so the point is I can for example right now stop the processor so I have stopped the processor no no more interrupts no more DMA transaction being initiated what I, I can do right now is to look at the DRAM memory. I can, in fact, look using the XMD at this specific location in the DRAM memory and see if I find the samples which are being generated by the sample generator. As you remember, 
from lesson seven, the sample generator was basically a counter. It was counting. So right now, if I look at this specific location in the DRAM memory, I should see a kind of counter, a kind of counting pattern. Okay. So for, for reading, in fact, different locations in the DRAM memory, you write the MRD command. And since right now the MMU is disabled, I don't need to run MRD physical command. I just need to run MRD command. MRD and MRD physical right now are the same because MMU is disabled. So MRD, then uh, the address. What was the address? The address was a zero zero and then four zeros, right? So let, let's come back to XMD environment, a zero zero and 10. What do you see? You see a counter counting. Okay, maybe 1000 was a little bit too much, but I go back up. Okay. So here is our counter, counting up to a point. And then you see random numbers. In fact, this is the region in the memory to which the Axel DMA is not writing anymore because the, the size of the packet that I am transferring each time is limited, okay? So if I come here, inside my interrupt handler I can see that the destination to which I am always writing the data is A0040 okay and the amount of data that I tell to the DMA engine to transfer is 256 bytes but there is a point here that I describe to you in the next video when we analyze the performance of our system okay so something that I can tell for sure right now is that my DMA engine is working and is transferring the data from the PL to the DRAM memory and this is exactly what we want but the questions are remaining how much is the performance what is the speed what is the maximum speed that I can gain? And are all of the data being transferred correctly? What should I consider to make sure that all of these data are being transferred correctly? These are the questions that I will answer in the next video. Okay, that is it for now. Thanks for watching this video. See you in the next video. Once more, I am Mohammad Sadri postdoctoral researcher at microelectronic system design uh, microelectronic system design research group of TU Kaisers Lautern these are my homemade hobby videos they are not official in any way I'm creating them for myself they are coming with no warranty or no guarantee or nothing and yeah thanks bye